Good morning. So you need to cheer me up here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, it's my honor to be here today to talk about leadership. And thank you for inviting me here. Um, thank you all for joining today. So half of my life was in this country, another half was in the United States. Uh, so I bring in a better perspective of the two cultures from the United States and here. I would like to kind of start with my humble story. Um, after graduating from here, I've been appointed for my master's. So while I was um, in the schools, I was facing the same kind of crisis, what we call the existential crisis, what you do after you graduate from college. I'm kind of an introvert personality, confined to my own world, reading about successful people's lives, thinking, analyzing, so I thought I'd be a research analyst. So I found a job as a market research analyst in Pune, right after I went to the United States, and I was looking for an equity research position. It's a highly lucrative, high caliber position, but I didn't get the position because I was not coming from elite uh, universities or, you know, I didn't have the background. So I got a sales position, obviously I couldn't survive. I went to business school there, two years, I spend my time there, and I have family there, so clearly close to $150,000 in student loan. And my credit card matched out. I have no way to survive. Back they can soar. One day I was traveling down to New York City with my wife, and I saw this beggar sitting on the street. And I told my wife, that man sitting right there may not be worth 10 cents, but he is worth more than $100, $150,000 more than me. That means I had $150,000 in debt before I can say I'm worth something. So I continued to pursue my dream to find my job that I can do happily, which was uh, research and banking side. So one day I got the job, um, got me $100,000 salary, happy to do it. Um, 80 hours I put in every week. My um, boss was very happy and gave me another position, additional positions. So that was an investment banking position. So it's kind of pretty much same, same situations and I could do a lot more work there. So we put together our first $10 million deal and my firm received a million dollars and my cut was, and I got a bonus check, a little over $100,000, close to 47, 48 lakhs rupees at that time, years ago. That was my blood, sweat and tears for years because I was struggling to get the job and I was continuing to make those kind of uh, paycheck month after month for years. That's my humble story. The story is uh, money follows, it's your passion. That's more important. That's when you build a life and career that is more meaningful to you. So today as workers in Wall Street as an investment banker, uh, those who are not familiar with Wall Street, which is uh, uh, home to the largest stock exchanges and centers of financial market, that's where you find uh, the who is who in the business world, all the leaders. So I had the opportunity to engage with uh, many of those leaders and understood what drives them, their motivation, their passion, how they build a team as part of my job as a banker. So what I wanted to show you is um, the, the, the qualities of successful leaders in different fields. I have a short video which is put together by Richard St. John, who was an attendee at the TED conference. TED conference is where you get to attend or watch lectures uh, from successful people on topic ranging from technology, education, and design. And while he was flying down to the conference, a little kid uh, sitting next to him asked a question, what success really leads to? He didn't have an answer, but he got the idea. He spent a few years interviewing 500 successful people at the TED conference and put together his observation, eight personality traits the first one stood out was passion. You need to be passionate about your life and career. You get knocked down several times, but you get up, you don't back up, keep moving. That's called what? Winning. To me, leadership is making other people's life better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. So I wanted to show you what um, Mahatma Gandhi has to say about leadership. According to him, leadership is not muscle, it's how you get along with people. We talk about humility. That's an important part of leadership. So what I did was I put together all these qualities into four points, which is your dream, your faith, your humility, and service to society. We just said about it's not for, you know, what is in it for me? It's not me, me, 
all the time. So we talk about um, service under social entrepreneurship, so we can kind of become better change agents. So I'll be touching on um, how you become global thinkers, effective change agents, um, better decision makers, and a skilled strategist. So let me start about dream. We all have dreams. Uh, it's never too late to dream. Martin Luther King, one of the greatest dreamers for a century, said, time is always right to dream what is right. So you can dream as a child, just as right as, uh, as uh, you know, an adult. And you can look around and see all sort of possibilities, everything that happened in our world, you know, it began as a dream. So you can gaze in the future and dream all sort of possibilities. But success is not an easy path. You know, you always hit the brick wall and you kind of think, you know, it's not for me and you cannot pass the next day, the following day, problems after problems. Then you kind of give up on your dreams and pursue what you're supposed to do. You are meant to dream. So you should not be deterred by the struggles or negativity you have to endure to accomplish your dreams. So you need to have the faith in you, that positive spirit. You know, it's our mindset. You know, we all think that maybe we'll have problems every day. You know, that's a, that's a state of mind or what you call the perspective. Life is not going to go on a straight line, but you need to continue to have the faith in you that you're going to get your dream accomplished sooner. So failure is just, um, you can take it as a wisdom as you go through your life. Um, I told you, you know, I can put you a list of people who are successful in different fields. You know, whether it's Mahatma Gandhi, it's Isaac Newton, or it's Edison, or, you know, Abraham Lincoln. So those people went... Um, experienced massive failures, numerous obstacles, challenges, setbacks before they achieved their name, fame, and wealth. So those are stories of struggle, survival, and pursuit of dreams against all odds. But you also know you cannot accomplish all your dreams by yourself or alone. It's a collaborative effort. You know, you're here and you're successful in a different field. A lot of people helped you. Your friends, family, parents, neighbors, society, community, right? So you need to have the same positive spirit as you look at others' future. That requires some humility in you. Faith gives you that humility, right? It just, uh, you know, we are all human, that means we are not perfect. So that humble ourselves. You know, Bible says, when you're humble, you're free from hatred, pride, arrogance, and you become spirit-filled, not demon-possessed. The Bible also says, when you're humble, you get along with people. That's what Gandhi said, you get along with people, your humility. So your ability to ruthlessly self-reflect and accurately learn your own weakness as much as your strength is very essential to reaping the benefits of humility. So it doesn't take a talent to tell someone, you know what, you're a loser, you know, you are not good, or finding fault with someone, but it takes talents and courage to tell someone what is right in the individual, what a great job he or she did. So you'll be amazed to see how important person you'll become, how attractive the person. So that is like, as a leader, it gives you enough competitive advantage, right? You're built to engage with people, welcome feedback, criticisms, that's an important part of leadership. So you can only treasure or receive uh, leadership once you have taken the journey into the very heart of who you are. You need to do the soul searching. That's key for that humility. So I want to talk about, um, before that, I think I was, okay. That's humility. Women leadership. Um, I brought a book here. This is written by Sheryl Sandberg. She is a chief operating officer of Facebook. I call her a um, crusader of feminism. In the book, she talks about gender gap in pay and leadership, and women need to lean in to be great leaders. Um, we live in a society where you know, men feel that women are inferior or women are subservient to men. And they question women's career commitment, aggressiveness, leadership abilities, and this pervasive pattern is endemic not only in these countries, outside the country too, wherever. It is like around the world. And we have that, you know, the demean or marginalized women and girls in society. So we have this stereotypical view, which is, you know, women are more communal, more sensitive, caretakers, caregivers, do have household duties, and men are more driven, more, you know, what do you call, uh, decisive and you know providers of the family so if you violate that view then it's become a taboo in society it's kind of frowned upon by society right so our campaign must be to um, transcend that uh, stereotypical view of women uh, that cloud of belief system and you know perpetuate the status quo so how you you kind of transcend that view which is it's a collaborative effort on the part of men 
women themselves and women leaders. Men must encourage other women to advocate for their own career advancement. Because in this country, more than half of uh, the population is women, and that means more than half of the potential. So we need to harness the potential, not trivialize it. It is not a zero-sum game where women gain and men lose. No, it's like, you know, nobody takes anybody's power away. That's where you create a holistic communal work environment where women and men flourish. Men, then women themselves need to own their success. They need to advocate for their own career advancement. And then to show self-confidence. Lack of self-confidence most of the time become what you call a self-fulfilling prophecy that kind of, you know, hurt their future performance. They need to um, defy the stereotypical view of women. They need to think big, take more risk, forge a path through the obstacles and achieve their full potential. Women, equally important, women in leadership positions are sometimes obstacles to other women getting in leadership position too. In a male-dominated environment, you know, women leaders tend to, um, you know, perpetuate the status quo, put other women down, it's become a competition. Women um, leaders are supposed to collaborate with other women, um, brainstorm together, um, share credit, not brag about it. That's when equal opportunity become equal. So I just want to talk a little bit more about um, what I call a leadership in detail. I wrote another book which is written by Bill George. I'm not in the book business, right? I'm not advocating this. In my own experience, I learned a lot about by reading Six People's Life. So I'm not selling any book here. Um, I would urge you to read uh, books uh, about Six People that you learn a lot of things that you don't get in business schools or other places. What he said about leadership is not a genetic characteristic. It is leaders are made through, you know, they made their way up through struggles and challenges after challenges. And we, I just, so you can look around and see how they became successful, failure after failure. So it's an inspiration to you all, those who are introvert, extrovert, you can be leaders. It is that passion in you, what we call the fire in your belly, what you want to be. So how you become an effective leader? It is not through a characteristic approach where, you know what, if you succeed, you're here, otherwise you're out of here. That's what happened in organization today, right? So in that situation, you know, it can drive results in the short run, that kind of culture, but um, you know, employees will be lying, cheating, and the sh long run results will be disastrous. And the morale will be down, employees will be stressed out, and in the process we heard before how you kind of keep those employees. It takes a lot of time and effort to, uh, to hire and retain an employee, and you don't want to have a stressed out employee. It becomes more monitoring psychological, how they support their families and build a career. So, especially in the changes taking place in today's world, the, the weirdest world we live in, everything is changing, right? We don't even know, so much uncertainty, what happens out there. So you need to learn new skills every day to survive. That's very important. We'll talk about social skills later. Learn a lot of skills. The skills, you need to constantly update your skills. And employees, again, you know, they, they, for you to survive in the, in the business though, the ch that change comes with a lot of stress. So as a leader, your ability to kind of help that individual to make the transition to learn the new skills is more important, not to kind of fire that individual. What we call the collaborative skill. It is not just leading a team alone, it's important as a leader, but being part of the team. That's key. We also said, I will talk about on how you become effective decision makers. Those who settle on decisions quickly, they know what they want. That's an important trait of a leader. In Wall Street, we call no pain, no gain, or you cannot eat well and sleep well. It's an ideal situation here. You can go to sleep and eat well and sleep, but you need to take the risk. The price of not making a decision is much more than the cost of making a mistake. So really have to take the risk in life. And that's when you get paid well and, you know, you succeed in life. So that's a key part of the collaborative skill. I just want to touch on the social skill as a leader people skill. Um, after graduating from Harvard, I had an opportunity to be a fellow at Harvard. Just a correction, I'm not a Harvard professor. Um, I used to be a fellow there, and I do some guest lecturing, and as I told you, I'm an investment banker, full-time job. I enjoy teaching people, and that's my passion. I used to travel back and forth from Boston to New York, quite often to do that teaching and my studies there. So, um, you know, when I was teaching there as a fellow, then they ask me questions about what is cost of capital and what is diversification, what is mean variance optimization, so efficient frontier, those type of things comes up in the corporate finance world. I explained to them um, uh, the, the concepts, the theories, and knowledge uh, around that, 
But I will tell also, uh, you cannot take those uh, models and concepts uh, literally. Because correlations, mark relationship changes so quickly, past is not a prediction for the future. You cannot predict the future just like that. It's changing. We heard a lot about you know, how the past is not an indicator of future projections or whatever that is. And I do a lot of forecasts in business school and in the first part of my job. So we make three-year forecasts, not more than that. Even then, that is you know, uncertain. We don't even know. But we have to make the assumption. So it amazes me all the time Business school plays a lot of emphasis on knowledge, concepts, and theories, and very little emphasis on what we all need to master, which is how you work with people or how you become human. Today, a company can do a lot more things with a fewer number of people. They can fire a lot of people and get a little thing done. Right? If you're looking for a highly competitive leadership jobs, high wage positions, you really need to master one thing, which is how you become human. Right? Your ability to collaborate with people, engage with people, customers, clients. Build a scorecard for your employees and how you can help them achieve them. Those, those important things. Computers cannot master those interactions. So I live in the United States and I watch uh, people, all the leaders successful, like talk about how you became successful. You can see a list of people, Indian immigrants successful in companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, or Pepsi. Right? They are running those companies. They are in the leadership positions. It is not education that made them where they are today. It is what we call, um, they come from an upbringing, upbringing in a culture that benefited from what we call the humility, a close-knit family ties, and respect for people around the world. That's what made them who they are. It is not an education elite organization or universities. It is a behavioral pattern that makes them more adaptable to situation, different situations, and help them more successful. So, I will just touch on, um, as part of um, um, our service society, we just heard about you know, service society, how they work, because we need a stable society for the business to thrive. And how you create that, we have responsibility, right? So I'll talk about how you become effective change agents and global thinkers um, in the context of uh, social entrepreneurship. What does entrepreneurship mean? It's finding a gap in the market and create and fill that market gap with honesty, integrity, and ethics, and make a difference in people's life. Because reputation is all we have got in life and career, right? You cannot damage that. So entrepreneurship is that, making a difference in people's life, that's more important. Today, companies pursue different strategies. One of the strategies to survive, how they become leaders become effective strategies. You know, in business school, you learn about Michael Porter's five forces, right? how you study the industry structure and how it's attractive and how you build the generic strategies whether it's a differentiation of course leadership. It is not. It's no longer the case. You may be surprised to you know. Michael Porter is a Harvard Business School professor in the strategy division. But these things have changed. Today what we call shaping the industry is, is a blue ocean strategy, which is breaking out of the um, red ocean or bloody competitions or existing crowd or competitive market and create a new market or making the competition more irrelevant and offer differentiation and low cost. That's become a win-win-win situation for employees, com customers, and um, the company. So differentiation academic terms, which we call is, is a productivity frontier. You have like a, a range of value versus cost structure, right, called cost trade-off that is available to a company. In other words, when you offer premium value, it costs more money. The cost structure going to lift up, and then you charge more. Right? But what we're talking about, you can offer a premium value at the same time, low cost. A lot of companies are doing it. Apple, for example, is doing it. They focus on their core strength, outsource a lot of non cost strength, and leverage that low cost. Toyota, for example, is an integrated strategy they pursue. They have a premium quality and a competitive price. So the strategy is now is a trade off. That's called the Blue Ocean strategy. Like you offer differentiation and low cost. That's the key part of it. So how do you do that? In a social, what is social entrepreneurship means? A lot of people in the United States and in Harvard, a lot of business school uh, students engage in social entrepreneurship, just kind of make changes in people's life and build a business out of it. Social entrepreneurship is making, you're becoming uh, agents of positive social change. It's different from other actors in the business, right? Make the best use for the society. 
the society benefits the most. That's the, that's the purpose of that social entrepreneurship. So how you do that, you know, you need to understand the ecosystem. You need to understand the, the community very well and kind of crack the code of the pressing problems that community faces, whether it is marginalization of women and girls, or it is a lack of uh, health care, clean water, uh, lack of education institutions. A lot of problems our community faces in many parts of the world. How you engage that. So you need to understand that. This is a story the Italian scientist, uh, he focused on sustainable farming and went to Zambia and told the Zambians the land is fertile, you can grow tomatoes. <laughs> so he grew the tomatoes and it's red, ripe and ready to harvest. One night, 200 keepers came from the river and ate all tomatoes. He told the story to the, the Zambians next morning. The Zambians laughed at him and told him, that's why we don't grow tomatoes here. So the scientists asked him, why didn't they tell me? You never asked. Appreciation is a wonderful thing. It makes what is excellent in others belong to us as well. Thank you, sir, for your unique and inspirational insights. I request Professor T. Abdul Karim Izliar, Executive Director, TKM Institute of Management, to present Memendu to Mr. Shahjan Nainan, MD, Network One Securitas, USC. Arun Krishnana from Rajani okay. Business School, sir. Sir, my question is, what, how the technology affects leadership and leader? I'm sorry, what's that? How the technology affects the leadership and leader? Oh, how technology affects leadership. Um, when I say that about uh, leadership is um, technology affects leadership, okay. Technology affects leadership, that's why I said about the social skill part of it, right? I talked about five, three or four people who succeed in um, business. Uh, Google, for example, is technology guy in Microsoft run by an Indian, Google is run by an Indian, and uh, Pepsi, for example, is run by an Indian. We had a city group run by an Indian. So those are Indian immigrants. So I was talked about building the social skill. Technology has taken over. It is no longer the technological skill that matters. You know, it's important. It's how you interact with people, how you become more human. So that's why I say you become the existential crisis before, right? Uh, you come out of the college and you see what you want to do. It's changing constantly. Everything is changing. You know, at some point, maybe computers will be able to interact with people and see, you know, what, how I interact with my employees, how I interact with my things, and you don't need a leader. It is no longer the case. You need to build that. That's the difference you say in te how technology affects the leadership things. It's very important that you need to build the social skill, your soft skill side of it. So that's very, very key. And I emphasize that part of the social side of it, right? It, I can watch these people. You know, I said these people, they, they, you know, these people are coming from a, what do you call, a, a technical field, you know, from IATs and other, you know, the pretty brilliant people, but clearly they have, a lot of people in the United States also, but what made them who they are today? Running this multi-billion dollar company in the United States, leading this company as leaders, Google, as young guys, because they're able to adapt to situations and take more risk, and I would emphasize the word humility. You need to be humble. That's when you engage with, interact with people, and build that, that leadership skill. I guess that answer your question, right? Yes, sir. Sir, okay. Uh, communication is a key point in leadership. Communication? It's a key point in leadership. Communication. Communication is an important Correct. point. Correct. Communication is important. Yeah, it's all about communication, right? So how do you empower and inspire people, right? We heard before talking about uh, your listening skill. The change is taking place in organizations so quickly, I cannot just tell them change it. You have to change yourself. I cannot force someone to change. So as a leader, your ability to sit with the understanding individual is putting the right person in the right place. We heard that before. That's leadership. Because if you know, like if you come to me and ask for a job, the first thing I'll ask you, what I saw you loud in the last job of the project you did, if you can tell me immediately, hey, this is what I liked in my last job, then I can figure out who you are, what you want, so that you can harness that potential and have win-win situation for both you and me. It is not a transformation, what you call a transactional experience of crafting a resume once you're coming out of the school. It is building that transformational experience intellectually, socially, and personally. That's very key. 
So, so you really have to have the communication skill in terms of understanding the individual's problems, engage with them very effectively. That's very key. How a shy person, a shy person, how he can develop his leadership skills, sir? Uh, how he can develop a, shy a leadership person. skill? Can you develop a leadership skill? A shy person. Okay, so that's one of the book up here. Uh, Bill Not. True, fine. You can. Yeah, you can be a leader. It's not like a genetic characteristic, like you're born with the leadership, some charismatic things. You work your way through. How you work your way through? It's like you kind of roll up your sleeve and work. You're not putting your suit and coat and go work in place. The only way you do is like you need to show the passion, engage with people, understand a lot of things, because it's a collaborative effort all the time. That's collaboration is more important. Learning different skills is a multidisciplinary thing. You know, in a business school, we learn a lot of things, right? We marketing, finance, and other things. There's a reason for that. Become more multidisciplinary. That's how you become, understand other people's skill set, understand others. So it's, that's why we always pursue the multidisciplinary process. So it is, it's very, very key in terms of, you know, understanding. So everybody, can, anybody can be a leader. Anybody can be a leader. I'm an introvert. I don't call myself a leader, but I know a lot of leaders. <laughs> so it is clearly, that's where it is. Right, any questions? Thank you, sir. And I would urge you to read that Bill North book and those women out there, you should read this Lean In book, which is very good. She talked about a lot of things about how you empower yourself and kind of, uh, you know, I have a, that was my Christmas gift to my child. The one, Lean In, my daughter. Okay. I'm Shinu Mary. I'm a student of MSN IMT Chavara and I have a doubt uh, what is the importance of Blue Ocean strategy in leadership? Important strategy in the leadership position. Okay. Um, I think I talked about a little bit about strategy, how you become effective strategies. I'm, I'm talking in terms of the, in the business world. Okay. I come from business world. I don't know much about other, other leaders. So, I wish you there. What happened? What happened? Everybody okay? Okay, so strategy, she's asking about strategy, how it's fit for the leadership. I said about strategy, it's just kind of understanding your vision of the company or your own vision. So strategy is basically um, the action you take to pursue your vision. That's what it is. What a vision you set up for a company, right? Two years from five years from what it's all you're trying to pursue. So strategy is just basically pursuing that vision with your decision, building that resource and capabilities that become more sustainable. That's where you build a sustainable competitive advantage. It can, it's become more inimitable, meaning you cannot copy it. So leaders has to figure that out. How they figure the, the thing in the business world is engage with people, understand who can do what. If I'm trying to put together a team as part of my strategy to do something or build some business, I need to know each individual's strength and weakness so that you can be happy in your area of expertise and I can harness that, and you'll be happy, I'm happy, the they kind of, that flow through the organization. So it's kind of understanding that, you know, uh, the strength and weakness of individual putting together. So a lot of companies, the human resource alone become a strategy, because like, for example, Southwest Airlines is a company which basically their competitive advantage is putting the right people in the right place. You get a smile on your face when you walk into the, you know, airport or wherever, the Southwest, the local strategy they're following. That's a strategy. Local strategy, the way they put everything together, but most importantly, the people they hire and retain, that strategy. And they don't hire anybody out there, they just want to have friendly, you know, people who can understand the difficulties, engage with the customer effectively. Those are, you know, I said all along, your interaction, your social skill. That's a strategy too for companies to pursue as a leader. That they, so, you know, those who are in the leadership position should be able to understand that and build it. So there's always a relationship between strategy and Company. See, companies are, you know, people. Peter Drucker caught it. Leadership is defined by results, not attributes. Had found its relevance on this session. I, on behalf of TKM Institute of Management, express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Shajan Nainan, MD, Network One Securities USA, for gracing the occasion as a lead speaker and throwing insights on leadership traits during VUCA times. I thank the participants too for their patient listening. Once again, thank